this presentation, we'll learn about exactly that. Let's welcome Patrick Joyce, co-founder of Research Hub. Hey, everybody. Yeah, so my name is Patrick, and I'm one of the co-founders of Research Hub. And today, I'm here to talk about how tokenization can help to fix academic science. So first, a little background on myself. I've been very lucky to drop out of not one, but two different academic science institutions. The first was a PhD program in molecular biology at Boston University, and the second was medical school at Georgetown University. So I think to help set the scene here of how academia works, I'd like to tell a little story. Um, when I was at BU, I was rotating through labs in my first year, and I was really lucky to work in the lab with a synthetic biologist by the name of Mo Boyle. Mo was an incredible scientist who was about 37 years old at the time, and during his postdoc, he had multiple Nature papers. Nature is the most prestigious scientific journal that exists. Despite the success, and he had about as much success as possible for that stage in his career, he was applying for an R01, which is one of the first grants you get as an early PI, and there was a six month time period where this person was just walking on eggshells, waiting for a decision of about 20 people to decide whether he deserved funding for the rest of his lab for the next couple of years. There was like this six month period of time where he had no idea if he was gonna receive this funding, despite being basically at the top of his field and was walking around on eggshells, worried that if he didn't get the funding, he was gonna to have to leave Boston University, pull his kids out of school, find a new institution, and really just start his career from the beginning. So for me, this is crazy. It was like, no matter how hard you work and how smart you are, there's like no job security in academic science. And so this is a good illustration of kind of a cliche that's uh, coined within science called publisher parish. Actually, less than 2% of first year PhD students end up becoming research professors. So this creates this like crazy competitive marketplace where scientists have to do almost anything they can in order to earn funding. Um, this creates a system of bad incentives where it ends up reducing the quality of research as a whole. There have been studies that have shown that about 85% of cancer biology research is unable to be reproduced. And so this is an extremely shaky foundation of knowledge that we end up building products on top of, and it causes a gigantic amount of waste, which has been estimated at over $170 billion annually. So why does this happen? I think there's a lot of wisdom in the late uh, Charlie Munger's words here, where sometimes the solution to a behavior problem resides within incentives. So I want to take a second to kind of break down an overview of how academia works. I like to think of like three buckets of participants. The first is grant givers, people who have research funding, who want to produce new knowledge. The second is scientists, people who have the technical ability to create new knowledge and need funding to do so. And then the third is publishers, uh, institutions that have distribution and largely are seeking profit. So to dive into the incentive of grant givers, people who have capital and they want to turn it into new knowledge. One of the problems that they're presented with is it's really, really hard to know who's a quality scientist. Brian mentioned in his talk earlier, if you're an investor trying to invest in a startup, there are objective metrics that you can look at in order to determine if a company is a good investment. You can look at their profit, you can look at their revenue, and it's pretty easy to compare one company to the next in order to decide who to give your money to. In science, this is a lot harder. There aren't like objective metrics like revenue um, that are easy to track and can be used to make these investment decisions. So there's been this kind of grandfathered in system of bibliometrics or citation based metrics. In order to be eligible for a grant in science, you need to publish a lot, be productive, and when you publish, you need to have content that's valued by your colleagues. And this is normally measured through citations. So in order to prove to a funder that I'm a good scientist, I need to be prolific, publish often, and when I publish, generate a lot of citations. There are a couple metrics that are used to kind of make this easier for funders. The first is an impact factor. This is a measure of quality of a journal. Essentially, if you publish in Nature, it's a very prestigious journal, lots of scientists read it, and so a lot of citations are generated by this journal. The next is H index, and this is kind of like a, a measure of the average number of citations that you generate over your career as a scientist. So again, like if I'm Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and I'm trying to decide between scientist A and scientist B, I'll look at where they publish, the impact factor of where they publish, and then their H index. 
as kind of like a proxy metric for how likely it is they'll produce good science in the future. The problem with this is scientists are really smart. When there's a hyper-competitive job market where 98% of first-year PhD students can't receive funding in order to do what they're passionate about, people optimize their behavior in order to have the chance to do a career in science. So there's this famous quote called Goodhart's Law. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So right now, funders are using bibliometrics as a measure of scientific quality. Unfortunately, it's becoming a target for behaviors and is no longer actually a good measure of scientific quality. Excuse the kind of outdated meme format here, but I think it, like, it illustrates the problem really well. So scientists need money. In order to get money, they need citations. It's easier to get published in a high impact factor journal by creating an editorial instead of original research, despite the fact that original research is much more valuable for society than an editorial. So the way we distribute capital in science right now actually encourages scientists to participate in low value behaviors. At Research Hub, we want to fix this. We're taking a two pronged approach. The first is to create an internet forum where anyone in the world can publish and talk about science. The second is to create research coin, a new way to incentivize behaviors where you can directly reward scientists for good research behaviors. This is a uh, image of our forum as it is today. Uh, it's kind of like a Reddit style forum where anyone, regardless of their academic expertise, can post papers, discuss them, publish new papers, comment, curate, and share peer reviews. We have an electronic lab notebook as well, where scientists, uh, academic and non-academic, can collaborate with anyone around the world in order to publish new research to research on. We also have a reference manager, which is a tool that every scientist uses in order to organize and annotate literature within their own work. Here's an example of an immunologist from our community named Paul, who's using our reference manager to lead inline comments with on, or within a scientific paper. This is actually pretty cool because he's doing a peer review here where rather than just leaving a paragraph describing the paper, he's actually pointing to direct sentences within the paper and criticizing them. And so Cole spent a lot of time, did a lot of work. He read the paper, criticized it, and shared it on research. Channel. When he did this, he received upvotes for doing so. And those upvotes allowed him to earn research point. And so once he got research point, what can he do with it? The first thing we're trying to explore is creating bounties. So essentially incentives for other scientists to come in and take an action on the site. There have been a lot of different kinds of bounties on Research Hub so far, and we're still very early trying to figure out the most valuable use case. These have ranged from uh, Jeff, a neuroimmunologist in our community, uh, was trying a new protocol in his lab. Uh, he was having trouble getting it to work, so he created a bounty on Research Hub and had another expert come in and help him troubleshoot. There's also been a pharma investor on Research Hub who is interested in new uh, neuroscience technologies. So he created a bounty for neuroscientists on our platform to jump on a 30-minute interview with him in order to get a landscape of the new developments within neuroscience. This is what it looks like on the platform. Another really cool use case is peer review. So if I share a preprint to BioArchive and I want to have a peer review on my work, I can take the research coin that I've already earned, create a bounty on my paper that incentivizes another scientist to come in and share a peer review on my work. One of the uh, coolest use cases we've had so far, um, if anybody remembers, maybe a couple months ago, uh, there were uh, you know, perceived aliens that were uh, presented to Mexican Congress. It was kind of cool. The scientists who did this, there was like a stir all over social media. You know, they kind of looked like paper mache. It was kind of hard to tell. Um, the scientists who presented these actually were able to take a DNA sample and they shared it to NCBI, which is kind of like this open access repository for genomic information. At Research Hub, we were like, oh wow, this is kind of wild. Like, I wonder how true this is. And so someone uh, took the DNA samples shared them to Research Hub, and created a bounty for a bioinformaticist to come in and analyze what was going on. And actually within 24 hours, we had a random bioinformaticist show up, earn $17 for doing some <laughs> analytics. And it turns out it's probably unlikely to actually be aliens, 
although I've actually heard some pushback recently, so we might need to follow up on this one. Another really cool thing is we want to help to direct peer review resources. I'm not sure if people are familiar here, but traditionally, peer review is done as kind of like a professional obligation. Scientists, you know, for lack of a better term, are guilt tripped into doing peer review for for-profit publishers. Um, they don't receive any compensation, and they do it because they believe it's the right thing to do. I think uh, almost fortunately, a younger generation of scientists are kind of refusing to do this. Um, they have so much to do, they have to work to get grants, and they see peer review for free as something that's uh, uh, unnecessary for the success of their own career. So what we're doing on Research Hub is we're taking preprints shared to BioArchive, automatically posting them to our forum, and creating automatic peer review bounties. So right now, if any of these preprints receive more than five upvotes, we automatically assign a peer review bounty of $150 to the preprint. So um, for example, we have this paper here, it's three down, from viral infections to Alzheimer's disease. This received uh, more than five upvotes, and an automatic peer review bounty was placed by the Research Hub Foundation. You can see there's a couple requirements, 30-day turnaround time, people need to um, have high quality in their uh, responses, you can't use LLMs to generate the content, and kind of amazingly, within two days, a scientist came in and shared a peer review. And uh, just for context, traditional peer review turnaround times within uh, Web2 journals are about like 90 to 180 days. So this is a large improvement, and then in the system, the peer reviewer was also compensated for their work, which is you know, surprisingly a novel concept for academic science. One of the things we're most excited about in Research Hub is a new feature around funding. Kind of as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, a lot of the issues within science are downstream from this kind of antiquated system that we use to distribute capital. So at Research Hub, we have a token, and we're playing around with new ways to fund research in order to encourage healthy research behaviors. Um, one of the problems with the current system is in order to get published in Nature, you need to have a compelling narrative. Your paper needs to be exciting enough for other scientists to be like, wow, that's cool, I want to read it. Um, unfortunately, not all science is exciting. And really, high quality science can actually be a little bit boring at times. And so this sort of incentive to create an interesting narrative reduces replicability because people will pee hack, they'll kind of massage their data, they'll make things sound better than they really are. And it's a source of a lot of the irreproducibility that we see in the world. So at Research Hub, we want to try and reward people for doing good science. Um, and so we're trying an, uh, an experiment where we fund via pre-registrations. A pre-registration is a document that a scientist creates where they basically lay out their plan for their research before they do it. They share a hypothesis, they share the methods for their study, and they tell you how they're going to analyze the data once they create it. The reason they do this is to keep themselves honest. If they conduct the experiment, the results aren't exciting. They have to stick to their plan of research rather than pivot halfway through in order to create something that might be more worthy of publication in a high impact journal. So what we have here is a, a user on Research Hub who's curious about can music impact the growth of lettuce? So uh, he shared a pre-registration with uh, a hypothesis that music could impact the growth of the lettuce. He shared methods and a plan for analysis, posted it. If you notice, this is a V3. The first version received feedback from other botanists and uh, community members in order to improve the study. The second version received more feedback. And then finally, the third version we felt was ready for funding. So Cole decided to post this. Um, I think it was like within an hour or something like that. He raised the $1,200 he needed in order to conduct this study. And so here's a picture of the experimental setup as he has it now. It's actually really cool. This is a, a very new thing that we're doing. And at Research Hub, generally, we like to ship as fast as possible and then just see how our users use the tool. Um, Cole decided to spin up his own hub where he's actually sharing updates on all of the data that he's collecting. So we're, we're probably, I guess, about a month into the study so far, and Cole shared maybe about 10 updates about the study, all posted to Research Hub. All of them are building community around the study, and he's also earning upvotes uh, and therefore research coin for doing this in the open. So Cole's actually making money for doing science in the open. 
This is uh, very, the very beginning of the study where he's describing exactly how he's setting up the experiment. And then this is the most recent update, day 24. The lettuce is growing. I think we're gonna take about 18 months or so in order to get the final results, and so I'm sure there will maybe be hundreds of different updates from Cole. And this is like, you know, kind of a small thing, growing lettuce with music, but I think you can imagine how this could be scaled up in the future, or if you wanted to study cancer biology. If you describe your methodology, describe your hypothesis and your plan for analysis, and then got it funded, and shared updates along the way, it would be a much better system than the kind of closed, slow process that we currently use today. So, a shameless plug, at Research Hub, we're planning to fund five different pre-registrations. So, over the course of the next month, we're gonna solicit applications. Um, if anyone here or anyone you know has a study they think they can conduct for less than $5,000, I encourage you to come to Research Hub, uh, share pre-registration, and talk to our community members in order to get your study funded. So I want to leave everybody with this quote and a QR code if you want to check out the website. Um, at the end of the day, we think the biggest problems in science are downstream of financial incentives. And we believe that ResearchCoin is a great way to create new financial incentives that empower our community to reward healthy research behaviors. Thank you all for your time.